long day uh, and a particularly long afternoon, but I think you'll all agree a very stimulating set of presentations. Uh, so it's, uh, I'm Anna Strutt, University of Waikato, so just down the road where the rugby is apparently today, but I'm giving up the rugby, I'd rather be here. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our final speaker for the day, Hosok Lee Makiyama. He's director of the European Centre for International Political Economy, which is a think tank focusing on global trade issues, active in Brussels, London and ASEAN countries. He's also a senior fellow of the London School of Economics and International Relations. He has a very impressive CV and background. Uh, in the past, he served as a diplomat for the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, he's represented the EU in the WTO and the United Nations. He's also worked in the private sector as corporate counsel and is regularly consulted by governments and international agencies on a, on a range of issues. Asuk has published... Uh, I think that's enough. I think that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> He's published widely um, and has been named, I've got to get this one in, as one of the 20 most influential people for an open internet um, by the UK-based Guardian. So I think we can see with his impressive credentials, wide experience, uh, that he's an ideal speaker to give us some insights to augment and bring together quite a bit of the discussion that we've had during the day. And uh, with that, I'd like to welcome him to present on the topic of where is the digital economy going? Thank you so much. Kia ora koutou katoa. Did I get that right? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, um, last speaker. And uh, I think it was Richard who said, uh, Asians start with an apology and Westerners start with a joke. So since I'm kind of a hybrid, I'm going to try to do both at the same time. Uh, first of all, I'm really, really grateful to be invited. So, yeah, well, thank to Jennifer and Rob to, well, flying me across the half the world, literally. Uh, if I fall asleep during the presentation, it's because of jet lag. <laughs> and, um, and also, uh, I think the topic is, where is the digital economy going? I think you may have expected a dot-com millionaire or a, a TED Talk guy who can talk about what the future of digital is going to be like. I'm sorry, I'm a boring bureaucrat just like you. <laughs> So that's my apology and a joke in the one package. Um, we've heard quite a lot in terms of what digital is and it's the new big shiny thing. I'd like to take a slightly different perspective and say that actually digital is already here and it's been with us for about two decades. No. Okay, I'm here, the screen is over there. <laughs> it's not gonna change because I'm not gonna use PowerPoint today. Um, and so, I would like to say that digitalization actually has been happening for two decades now. And it's not a new thing, it's been going on, it's already big. Uh, the sort of the standard number I bring out is that if you just count the turnover e-commerce, it's about $2.4 trillion per year. <coughs> and it's still growing, it's growing at 24% per year. So what does it mean for someone who's in international trade like myself. It means basically that if e-commerce was a country, it would, be a, it would qualify to be a member of G7. Uh, it was probably the only grown up in G7, but that's something completely different. It means that it's still growing four times faster than the Chinese economy. And probably, most of the world would, if it was a sovereign economy, most of the world would line up to sign free trade agreements with it. And my guess is that hmm, if it refused, our American friends would have to invade it. But, I mean, this is basically, you know, the horizontal cut of the economy across different territories. We also heard about how important it is for international trade from Sherry and many other people today, and I think that's absolutely, absolutely right. But also it's very, very vulnerable. Uh, we are gonna talk a little bit about how easily you can actually kill off a digital business or a traditional business, if you like. 
And, uh, but one of the things I would like to really, really address already at the beginning is we t think of digital as something platforms, sales, and online activities. We think about Google and Amazon. And that's really wrong way to go about it. Uh, one of the surveys I have done is to see how much connectivity is a part of actually a business input. So if you put, for example, cost of electricity, cost of labor, raw materials, and I found that about 5% of actually machinery and manufacturing is actually data and connectivity. It's actually more than electricity and labor. In the old days, you know, the times of the First World War, our grandparents, you know, they would actually go out and fight a war to secure their steel uh, input. And this is actually very much an input game. It has moved from being something that we would call, we can call it a value chain if you like, but it, you know, in simplistic terms, what we are simply talking about is the fact that we have a vital resource that governments and businesses fighting over. And security of the supply has become paramount. And this is something we also see in the tech conflict between the United States and China. It's all about supplies. It's actually more about input than output. And in the services industry, we are talking about somewhere between 7 and 30%, depending on which sector you're looking at. And essentially, connectivity and data and software is basically everything. It's not that surprising if you think about how much time you spend in front of Google to try to you know, search for the answer rather than actually try to find out the answer the old fashioned way. You just look for the accumulated information or a speech that PM has already given that you can cut and paste and rephrase a little bit and it sounds okay. Okay, some people are laughing a little bit too. What? And then I know, of course not. Yeah. <laughs> we can't do that because we have 21 different official languages. <laughs> well, maybe AI will fix that now. But basically what I'm trying to say here is that the paradigm in terms of digital trade policy has changed from actually offensive in terms of just, not just market access, but also securing supply. And that has become an equally important objective. And this is where I think it's really interesting that data localization, for example, that um, uh, um, the previous presentation brought up, uh, amongst others, is that the reason why this is important is because actually it breaks the business model. It's not so important for a company like Google or Amazon because they are really in building data farm business. They could probably build one in each country if they wanted to. But imagine a company like FedEx. Basically, everything they do contains personal information because it has an address of the sender and the recipient. And if every country in the world would actually require them to store the data locally, that means that they would have to build 200 data servers around the world, and the business is broken. And the example I mentioned to you about, for example, the, the machinery and the car industry, 5% of input is data. So what would happen if you double the price of data inputs for the car industry or the general manufacturing industry? Yeah, so those 5% would suddenly become 10%, right? So if I told you the average profit margin for the car industry is 4.5%, do you know what that means? The car factory just went bankrupt. That's what it means on the first year. So it gives an unprecedented power through regulatory measures to actually decide who can operate in the economy or who cannot. And the example I think the Sherry brought up was brilliant about her cars, you know, two server break breakdowns, blue screen of death on her Nissan, and basically you have a very, very expensive piece of brick. Yeah. Well, what kind of car was that? Very petit bourgeois. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, okay, you're forgiven. You live in America, so you're, you're allowed to drive an SUV. Yeah. You know, in London, we used to call them Chelsea tractors after, you know, the, the fanciest district in London, uh, which is called Chelsea. But anyway, so this is the impact of um, what some of these measures can do. But also, one thing that is quite surprising, and this is another data point when it comes to, it's not just about Google and Amazon. Um, it's actually the fact that as much as we are talking about data fragmentation and the services supply chain, what is actually quite remarkable is that actually we don't necessarily trade in connectivity. We don't actually necessarily trade in data. When I looked actually for um, um, Professor Kimura, uh, we, I was writing an article for Area, and uh, I looked at how much of the ASEAN ICT sector was actually imported outside of the national economy. So if you look at, for example, Indonesia, Malaysia, how much of what we call connectivity and data is actually imported from other places? Have a guess. How much do you think it is? The powerful Google and Amazon and Facebooks of the world. 82% is sourced domestically. So we heard example of the online ads that is eating up the profits from the local newspapers. Who are the biggest purveyor of online advertising? The local newspaper. Why? People want to read local news. You may be in a slightly different situation because New Zealand, Anglosphere, but for the rest of the world, you know, outside of Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, that is really not the case. You know, well, okay, even in, even in Sweden, you know, we speak, this is my third language, by the way, so please do forgive me if I insult any one of you. It's really not intentional. Uh, um, it's just a language barrier, of course. Uh, <laughs> now, what, I, what, I, what I'm really trying to say here is that actually most of the digital economy is really domestic, and that's what the data shows. Now, the scary part of the data that I was looking at is actually that ASEAN countries is better integrated with the United States rather than with each other. So if I actually look at the, the remaining 20% that was actually imported, you could actually see that it was not really from the neighbors. It was better integrated with the United States. And we see actually similar data even for Europe, that practically 80% is domestic. And one thing that is actually quite, I say fascinating and interesting, because I'm really interested by myself and my own work, obviously. And, uh, <laughs> but one thing that is quite interesting is the fact that if you look at the last 10 15 years, so every five years backwards, this number hasn't changed. It's pretty constant. And that is the reality of the internet. Internet is actually quite local. And I'm gonna make one last joke about Google and Amazon, and especially considering the question about taxes came up. Um, I do understand it's a concern that the transnational companies do not pay taxes very often in the destination countries. I, I get that. But the platform companies and internet, the Silicon Valley companies consist of Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, and Microsoft, and I also had IBM. They account for about 0.1% of the current account with the Asia Pacific region. <laughs> So if you're really, really riled up about those 0.1%, the natural follow-up question is, why don't you care about the remaining 99.9? And the answer, I think, is the fact that what the internet has done is that it has actually made a lot of our toolboxes, us regulated, well, actually, I was fired from my government, so I shouldn't say us anymore, but, <laughs> but it has made a lot of the classic tools like industrial policy useless because the classic idea of the post-war theory on industrial policy is national champions protect your borders, scale up, export as much as you can, exploit the economy of scale in production. 
what the internet did was that actually, by removing fixed costs from the balance sheets, you basically said, no, actually, scale doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the scale, not the scale of supply. It's actually scale of demand, that you can scale as many users as possible. And that completely can change the game. And for, for example, a company out of classic mercantilist countries, for example, like Germany, this is a fundamental rethink because the, all the tools to promote your national industry has been rendered useless. What I'd like to also point out here is that just because the policymakers' tools have become useless does not necessarily mean that actually the, the craft and the, that the business is useless. Let me explain that using a small joke, <laughs> which is actually a true story when a, um, a prominent Asian economy, uh, the trade minister of that country, I'm, I'm not telling you which country it is because the camera is on, but it's, okay? Um, visited actually the, the, um, uh, the German, uh, his, uh, his German counterpart uh, in Berlin. And during this period, the Germans were all about industrial revolution and taking protectionist measures against Silicon Valley. And that made this Asian trade minister a little bit perplexed. Germany, with its wonderful engineers and designers, and you know, all your history in car manufacturing, why are you so scared about a company who cannot even build glasses? And we're talking about Google, who had just failed producing the glasses. And there's some, actually some truth in it, because there, just because the regulatory toolbox is exhausted does not necessarily mean that the innovative power of your business has been exhausted too. And this is actually a, a very much, I think, a misunderstanding that takes place in most of the times that you know, regulators tend to think that actually the fact that they don't, act, they don't have full control of the economy as they used to do in the 1970s and 80s, that means that there has been a market failure. That's not necessarily the case. It could be that. Um, and also, uh, moving forward, um, what does that actually mean uh, in terms of trade policy? Um, I think, as I said, the economy is more vulnerable than before. And I did a survey of all the so-called digital trade barriers. And one thing that I found was that when we looked at around 80 countries, uh, including New Zealand, <laughs> we found that actually most of the barriers are pretty mundane and traditional. We are talking about classic market access and establish establishment barriers, including tariffs. You know, if, because the internet economy is actually based on both devices and services. It's not just data. Data is actually pretty useless on its own unless you have a device to actually render the data on, or if, unless you can actually systemize that data into some kind of a meaningful information, like a picture of a boy or a girl in a dating app that you can swipe left or right, you know, unless you can actually somehow not just aggregate that data, but as, as long as the data has a meaning, it's actually pretty useless. And so we are looking at pretty actually standard form of data barriers, and we are talking about tariffs, we are talking about residency requirements, and we are still talking about foreign equity caps, and most of all, licensing. Let me take China as an example. China consider e-commerce to be a telecom operator activity. It's a value-added telecom service. So you need to apply for a license just like you would set up your own operator, you would actually have to apply for a license. And they actually abolished foreign equity cap on e-commerce last year. So anyone can technically invest in an e-commerce service online in China. But how many licenses do you think they have issued? Have a guess. What? Oh, 
come on, give our Chinese friends a little bit of credibility. They issued one. <laughs> uh, it's to a Japanese retailer called Heiwado, and they have to build about 15 department stores before they actually got that license. Uh, <laughs> but in addition, we have also blockages. You can basically just cut off the internet access. Uh, censorship, and that works per perfectly well. We talked about data localization. Another measure I think that is quite interesting, which goes down to the, the model of scaling demand that I was talking about, is intermediate liability. If you expose a business to disproportionate risks, you will at some point have to surrender. If you give YouTube an hour to remove, let's say, dangerous content, could be an extremist chopping the head off of a um, poor kidnapped aid worker, or it could be hate speech, it could be bullying, it could be latest song by Taylor Swift that she doesn't want to have online. Um, if you put a time restriction, say, okay, you have to take it down between an hour or five minutes, or you're unlimitedly liable for whatever your user upload. Obviously, this is going to be a disproportionate legal risk. You prefer to withdraw from the market rather than actually <coughs> assuming that risk. And there's been a lot of conversation around this because of disinformation and also Quite a, lot of uh, quite a lot of debate is also about hate speech. And there has been quite interesting experiments around the world in the infancy of internet. For example, South Korea tried to actually abolish anonymity on the internet because they didn't want to deal with the intermediary liability problem. So if the user is always identifiable, we don't have the, prob the YouTube problem I mentioned. So we don't have the trade barrier. Uh, until they realized that actually in the rest of the internet, everyone is anonymous. So it was just detrimental to local South Korean online services. There's actually a very interesting lower court ruling, I think from Seoul, um, that said this is one of the most stupidest rules that have been enacted by the government. And uh, having a judge say that is actually quite, I don't know, I was going to say refreshing, but I can also say Korean. Um, yeah, so essentially it can be stopped in every possible way, and which makes actually the economy more vulnerable than before. And um, it's probably not a surprise that actually the most restrictive economy in the world right now uh, is probably China. We measure the restrictiveness and openness of an economy. And I will admit here that there is some research bias. Uh, because obviously, if we try to map what kind of trade restrictions they are, we always start with the most restrictive country and try to see if there are similar restrictions elsewhere. So I'll, I'll make a small caveat and I'll be a good researcher and say that there might be a slightly bit of research. <laughs> Uh, bias, but we are looking at, uh, well, restrictiveness of around 70%, where zero is completely open, and 100% is basically you're doing everything wrong. Or, okay, not right or wrong, but very restrictive. And we measure restrictiveness in terms of if you discriminate the digital economy versus the traditional offline. So, for example, if there is a product you can sell in a regular shop, for, but for some reason, you can't just do it online. We also looked at the classic national treatment, uh, the lack of national treatment, i.e. foreigners cannot do things that the locals can do. And this is quite interesting, but most economies are around 25 to 35%. There are a couple of exceptions. One of them is New Zealand. I think someone mentioned it before. Uh, that actually New Zealand managed to score as the most open digital economy amongst the countries that we're looking at. And by the way, if you want to come over and give a speech about how successful you have been in actually 
effectively regulating and social responsibility and all that while maintaining an openness. You're welcome to come to Brussels anytime. I'm not sure you know, people in EU would listen to you, but I, I would have an audience. So this is, yeah, this is the, um, the, the reality uh, of um, the digital economy that I don't think it's getting more open. I think it's actually becoming less open. And uh, the tradability has increased, but actually the, um, the methods of government interference have been actually becoming more sophisticated. And here's where I think the richest presentation is, is always brilliant. And sometimes, at least on one occasion, I've been brought on, on as, you know, the, you know, the guy who comes after the main act, like, you know, they let Beatles perform, then bring on Yoko Ono to say a few words. Yeah, so th that was me, basically Richard's punch bag. And I think this was in Vienna. And he had his book out, The Great Convergence. And we talked about the, all the fantastic things you will be doing in the future. And I was talking about the minor divergence, which is basically everything that the governments will do to stop it from making it happen. And I think there is some truth in that. And it's going to get worse. Why? Um, let me take a few case examples. This babysitter called. <laughs> uh, let me start with 5G. Um, this is one of the buzzwords uh, that's been flying around. We have 26 billion new devices going online right now. And you don't know it, but it's already, half of them are probably already in your homes. And uh, we are going to be connected in a way that we don't expect. And that is going to put a lot of new constraints and new sensitivities. And of course, new business models. Uh, we had a conversation here over lunch that, you know, five, and I tried to explain that 5G is not really about really, really fast internet for users anymore. Because let's face it, you know, you already have ultra HD on your Netflix. You know, you don't need that more bandwidth. The real use of 5G is going to be industrial internet, basically connecting trucks, machinery, Floor, store floor locations, basically a business going to be virtualized and digitalized where you store documents today for a business. You know, you write a business plan, you have your Excel sheets and you have your remuneration sheets, etc. on the cloud. In the future, basically, well, future, okay, in two years, the 5G connection is actually going to connect the factory with the designers, with the stores. So for example, if a store is starting to run low on stock, the, f the factory machinery is just automatically going to start. And the trucks is going to automatically be directed to the factory to take the stuff to the store. This is the real life business. It moves from actually information to control. Can you see where this is going that this can this could get ugly if you have one malicious hacker. My standard joke, I have a few, I have a few more, is that you will be actually be able to copy paste a company with two keystrokes. Every factory setting, every machine setting, the speed that your trucks are driving through a town like Jakarta in order to make the deliveries on time, Everything. It's not just blueprints. It's the whole setup. And that's quite fascinating. And if you listen to people who really know about risks, insurers, they tell me that the cost already of cyber espionage and hacking and disruptions is around $6 trillion. Remember I told you about the size of the digital economy? Three trillion. <laughs> it's bigger than actually the entire turnover of e-commerce business. So that's how big the risk exposure is. And there are of course intelligence issues around this and you know, there's state-sponsored threat actors who are 
um, looking into exploiting the 5G networks, and there are governments who are trying to stop them, and then there are governments who are trying to stop anyone who comes out of a country that start with C and end with Heine. Um, but that's, um, that's one major concern, and uh, where I think that we will see more uh, trade restriction being imposed. The second question is around AI, uh, because AI runs on personal information. Actually, on, if you're looking at regular IP traffic between a device like this, and which is connected, let's say, to a PowerPoint presentation or the cloud, or whatever it is, any data transmission contains personal information at least by the definition of, let's say, a law like the EU, because it contains metadata. It contains address, uh, IP address, it contains email address. Every data transmission contains something that is personal. Even if you, you're not logged in, it's the first time you open a fresh computer and you connect to, let's say, anonymously to, yeah, Google. You are not logged in, but there are st you can st a government on the grounds of personal information law can still block that data transmission because it contains what we call metadata. Data that can be used to trace a user. Uh, once again, this is the arbitrariness of the regulatory tools. It gives, this is the, uh, maybe the, the overall theme of maybe the, my entire presentation is that if you give an executive power, the power to whack anyone on the market, and we know for a fact that the regulator cannot whack everyone on the market, then it becomes arbitrary in the sense that the executive has to choose who he or she is going to whack. Do you follow my logic? And here's where I think a lot of exporters and businesses, and sometimes even users, are concerned about how is that selection gonna be made. And this is, of course, if you have a very, very wide and broad definition of what personal information is, and you know for a fact that, for example, in Europe, every Tom and Dick and Harry is in the violation of the GDPR, or privacy law. If everyone is in violation of it, once again, who are you going to choose? Of course, the popular guess is that you're gonna go after any American company whose company name rhymes with noodle, or if you happen to run an e-commerce store that is named after a major South American river. Um, but going to the AI question, uh, since AI actually feeds on personal information, it is going to be very vital that you actually have constant access to data. Let me take you one example of how some restriction can have unintended consequences. So for example, um, in Europe, uh, automakers are developing algorithm for self-driving, autonomous driving cars using YouTube videos <laughs> because a stop sign in Peru looks very different than a stop sign in Brussels. So they can't have a car driving around every country in the world. If they release a car, they must be absolutely sure that you can actually drive in every country in the world. How do they do that? They download images on the internet and show it. Here's, here's a, someone's vacation pictures that they have actually uploaded on the Flickr and of their vacation in Peru. And this is what a stop sign looks like. This is what a tunnel looks like in Switzerland. And EU trying to actually impose a law that said this called automated data mining could only be undertaken by universities and researchers because they thought that the commercial application of this would be dangerous. What would that mean? I mean, I run a think tank, I'm a researcher. Come on, you know, I'd be very happy to do that for the car, car companies. I would love that law because, you know, they can't do it, so they need people like me as a proxy to do it. But do you understand how silly the outcome is if you're actually saying that you can't do something because 
we don't actually know, know what the consequences are going to be. What I'm trying to tell you here with this little story about AI is that, yes, I'm sure half of the things that Richard is talking about in his book is going to happen. But I'm not sure all of them are market failures. And the principle that we have lived by in the world, in any other product, everything from banking to food, is that we don't actually intervene unless we can see a market failure happening. It's called judicial prudence. It could also be called, no, we don't actually have the resources to run around the planet and try to you know, prevent accidents before they happen. We just can't do that. Um, another story that I can tell is that you know, Coca-Cola and Kentucky Fried Chicken, they have their secret recipes. You know, in a world where food producers don't actually have to report and reveal the recipe of food products that we actually put in our mouth until people start end up in hospital, basically, until that happens, until you have the market failure, you have no requirement to actually show what Coca-Cola contains. In that world, somehow we are saying, yeah, but we would like to know the source code before we see a market failure. And that is somehow a little bit perplexing. And I, I do get some of the reservations around AI, around, for example, the questions on um, yeah, um, unemployment. But I'm not sure if the data is right. And if you haven't figured this out already, I'm a, I'm a little bit cynical. I have sometimes, I, I prefer to think that, you know, it's better to be a realist than an optimist because the realists tend to be right. <laughs> um, and this is because I have a, my background in international trade. But the thing is like this. I do understand that the AI is going to be revolutionizing. It might lead to major joblessness and white color. Uh, white collar workers, but the data proves something different. We already had a major produ labor productivity increase that was much bigger than AI. It's when the PCs end up on our desks in the, in the early 80s, and the Microsoft Office package suddenly allowed us to actually share documents, collaborate with data, collaborate with, uh, in typing up a document, doing spreadsheets. We couldn't do that before. We had word processors, secretaries, and a graphics department who was responsible to do overhead transparencies. And despite the major productivity increase that we had from PCs, that didn't lead to a major job, job loss in any economy. Why? Because companies seek to be competitive. If they have a redundancy, they invest that redundancy into something new to steal more market shares. In the 80s and the 90s, thanks to the, uh, the PC revolution, the efforts went into two things, marketing and branding, and middle management. My standard joke here, once again, is that people started to make PowerPoints. People started responding to email all the things that we didn't do before. Efficiencies create new investment, and therefore, there's very little evidence that shows that it's going to lead to actually concrete job, loss, job losses. And I think that also applies to manufacturing. And I, I dispute some of the numbers that have been flown around that, yes, it is true that United States lost a million manufacturing jobs, uh, but I ref it, some of them were, yes, lost to China, but most of them were actually lost to the services sector. Let me explain. How many of you know someone who used to do a blue-collar job? Uh, someone in your family? And as you grow older, suddenly you had a managerial job. If you were working in an auto shop, you suddenly moved into an office at the back of the auto shop. You were doing Customer, customer representation. If you're, IBM is a great example. 
if you're working at the assembly line at IBM in Burlington, 10 years down your career, at some point, you are going to be a sales rep, you may have become a product manager, you might be doing PowerPoints for a living. Everyone knows a dad or mom who has gone to that career path, who maybe just had a high school degree or actually had, you know, went into a manufacturing job but ended up being a manager. We stole the manufacturing jobs from ourselves. We upgraded those jobs. They were never lost. Anyway, um, so what does that mean in terms of trail rules? I think, once again, the previous presentations are absolutely right. Uh, there is not much commitment. Um, but let me just audit through in the last 10 minutes I have, because now we are getting to the juicy part, especially for you guys who are working for the trade section of the MFAT. So here's how I'm going to be really, really cynical. First of all, I would like to point out that there are already rules in the WTO system uh, through the case law, especially, for example, through uh, um, Antig uh, the case uh, that was launched by Antigua uh, on uh, online gambling, and uh, which basically said that you cannot restrict uh, internet um, internet providing uh, it services provided online if you have taken a commitment, and even if it's actually even if you have relevant exceptions, so for example, in this case, public morale and public order, you have to prove that your restrictions are necessary and least trade restrictive. And the United States never managed to prove that because they actually had online gambling, which was run by the ethnic minorities, so the, the Indian gambling, the, the, the yeah, the, uh, the Gambling Act, which allowed for certain groups in the United States to actually still do gambling. So you cannot allow it for one certain group of people, but at the same time, you can't say, okay, but foreigners can't do it. And that's actually a quite interesting case, and there's actually a lot of tragedy around this, because in Antigua, there was, there was a huge online web farming business that were created around the gambling industry that was cut off overnight because the um, United States used the Wire Act to basically cut off that industry. And it, yeah, there, there's actually movies about this if you're interested in seeing it. But in short, what I'm trying to say is that there are already commitments and they are not being used. So the question is, if you're extra cynical today and a little bit jet lagged and craving for that coffee over there, you're gonna, the conclusion is, how can you have new commitments when the members are actually not using the existing ones? <laughs> it begs a, at least a philosophical question, I think. But running down the line, uh, I'm going to give New Zealand a lot of credit here. Uh, we do have new disciplines, which goes actually across both goods and services which were created in the CPTPP and which was the first data-specific discipline and uh, which covers uh, cross-border transfer of information. Article 11, I think, explicitly said the, uh, the party shall allow for cross-border transfer of information. There's also a discipline on data localization. Required entity, uh, sorry, um, covered entities uh, must, uh, cannot require a covered person to use or locate a computing facility in the territory. And uh, in the end, these bindings are great, the, but the main rule of drafting trade agreements, you can write that you, sh you shall allow for data flow, so you can say that you cannot have data localization. In the end, it's all down to exceptions. And this is very much how things are negotiated. You have a main principle that ev even Europe can agree to them, but in the end, we're going to have very different exceptions depending on who we are negotiating with. And um, just to try to wrap it up, um, in CPTPP, you have actually wider exceptions than you have in the WTO. WTO has a very specific catalog 
of very specific three typical cases where you can apply exception. In, as you know, in CPTPP, it's for legitimate public policy objectives. What is a legitimate public policy objectives? In the government's eye, you know, I'll never ever find a government. Not even Mr. Putin will say, actually, I'm pursuing a non-legitimate public policy objective, so please forgive me. I'm guilty as charged. That's just never, ever going to happen. Um, the interesting side of this, I think, is the USMCA. And it really proves that Americans actually know how to draft. They change the language from shall, uh, shall allow to shall not prohibit or restrict. Do you see what happened there? Semantics. Shall allow means that still a you know, CPTPP gold standard. You shall allow, but that means probably that you can do some restriction tweaking, right? But if you say you cannot restrict, now you're going for the gold to the platinum club. You cannot make any restriction whatsoever unless you have this exception. Well, Americans had two years to think about them, so don't give them too much credit. And also source code uh, restrictions. There are now in the USMCA, I think, new provisions uh, that add, so, uh, aside from source code for software, it also includes algorithm. I think it's actually cosmetic because in the end, these bilateral commitments can only be taken unless you actually have intention to follow through. Let me just explain. FTAs are less enforceable than multilateral rules, and, and therefore the commitments are taken under the, they are only taken if the governments themselves have no intention to violate them. Do you see what I mean? It's always, the FTAs more or less always take place between like-minded parties. Um, just to sort of, inf yeah, I know it's time. Pass quickly when, when you're having fun. but. EU approach, I think, to this uh, is very different because we have a general exception that is completely subjective to privacy rules. What does that actually mean? We only have unlimited reservations for nuclear materials, national security, and EU puts privacy on the same level. That basically means, what I, remember what I told you about almost all data containing some form of personal information, you can technically, I'm just gonna blurt it right out. I'm gonna even look at the cameras and I'm gonna wait to Lucian. <laughs> but it basically, it means that the commitment is actually not worth anything. That's what it means. Um, I can say a couple of words about the ASEAN approach. Uh, ASEAN has also its own exception in the ASEAN e-commerce framework. It basically means, it has all the right disciplines, but it says, except where there's a domestic law that says something else, which basically means that you should not have a law against data localization, except when you have, then it's okay. But <laughs> it, it, it is simplifying a little bit, but in, in effect, that, that's what it means. So let, let, let me just, for the last two and a half seconds, uh, try to wrap up, what does it actually mean going forward, especially in terms of e-commerce uh, negotiation, the WTO, and I'd like to say a couple of words about the, the DEPA talks between Chile, New Zealand, and uh, Chile, New Zealand, Singapore. Uh, in terms of e-commerce, what does that actually mean? Yeah, it means that if you have China and United States in the room and Europe in the middle, as you very eloquently put, it's very clear, there are 11 proposals in, I think now, in the GSI negotiation, including one from New Zealand. Uh, even countries who are not part of the CPTPP is referring to CPTPP text. Chinese Taipei has a table of very good text which is completely based on CPTPP. Japan as well. But in the end, it's gonna be the least common denominator. In a, in a world where we have so many reservations around taxation, uh, cybersecurity, privacy, this is going to be not an easy game. It's not gonna be a, you cannot square that circle. 
And another point I would like to make in terms of GSI is that I'm not sure this is the right time to invent a new schedule. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but there is an idea that we are going to have a new schedule for online activity. So in, in GATT schedules, the specific commitments you have for different modes, and you have the uh, commitments for MFN and national treatment, and then we're gonna have another column called internet. Now is not the time to collect new commitments. We may actually have, we may take two steps back. If we are actually saying the old commitments does not apply to the internet, and we're gonna create a new schedule, and basically people are going to lowball. They're gonna actually give less market access and national treatment than they did before. And one final point, and this is really going to be the final point, around DEPA and uh, also Japan's idea around DFFT, Data Free Flow with Trust, which has been very often referred. And I think despite the very idiosyncratic English grammar in that wording, DFFT, there's a lot of actually thought in that. Actually, uh, I think DFFT was created out of a drafting serendipity, but that's an anecdote that I can spare for the, uh, the cocktails later. But I think there's some truth in it, because basically what it basically says is that we can liberalize where there is trust. Where there is no trust, we have to revert back to WTO and e-commerce negotiations. So think of the least common denominator, and we can add trust. What does trust mean? Let me walk through three different models of trust. One is the unilateral model that the EU uses for its privacy law. If you copy paste our laws, basically normative harmonization of legislation, and this is where a developing country would probably say colonialism, we trust you, we can have free flow of data. So this is the adequacy decision. New Zealand didn't do copy-paste, but it has a very good privacy law, so therefore we have granted advocacy, and we have free data flows. We don't actually even need data disciplines in FTAs, because basically, as far as we are concerned, New Zealand is an EU member. Well, we need a replacement, actually an upgrade since UK left, but that's, that's something completely different. Uh, the second level, which I think is the American model that the USMCA uh, is undertaking, which contains actually provisions of principles, references to CBPR and OECD guidelines, which is basically to say, you need to follow the following frameworks, then you're fine. If you don't follow them, well, if you sign this contract, you are now here by following them. So you, basically, you create new instruments in order to create an interoperability between two jurisdictions without changing the laws between them. That's another level of trust. And the other way of actually, I think we should uh, think about is that we have other, I mean, what, what is trust? Which means that if you have a cyber crime or if you have some kind of a transgression taking place in Chile that originates from Chile that affects the New Zealand population, you may want to have the means to actually address the problem. We're already doing it in law enforcement. It's called the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaties. We can actually combine, combine different instruments to create that trust in order to liberalize the economies between us, if it is a trustworthy partner on the other side, of course. And here's where I'm really, really gonna wrap up. And Thank you so much for your patience. Well, thank you very much. Time certainly does go fast when we're having fun, and uh, what a wonderful end to a very stimulating day. I'm afraid that quite a number of people do have to run off and catch a play now, so we're actually going to close without that. There are two questions I can see online, but I'm actually going to have to move those, those to the coffee break so we can have a brief final uh, wrap-up. Uh, but thank you very much to our uh, wonderful last presenter, and thank you very much to all the presenters for a re very rich day of insights.
So um, I'm going to do this very quickly before 40 people run to get a bus and go home. Um, I just want to um, start by thanking you all for your um, participation as a really avid audience and, and for all the terrific discussions that we had happening in the, in the coffee breaks. And we'll be sending around um, some uh, forms or some kind of survey. We'd really appreciate your feedback um, on how this inaugural one went and how we can do it better next year. And so please tell your friends and your colleagues that there will be a next year, perhaps a little bit earlier than this year because it'll be an election, but nevertheless, um, this is just the start of many, we hope. Um, I have a few thank yous to make just before I let you go. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank MFAT, um, particularly the Auckland office team, um, Caroline, Christy, and their people. Um, it's been great working with you, and I look forward to doing it again. To our sponsors, the Sealy Trust, the North Asia Cape, the New Zealand Asia Foundation, and our Vice Chancellor's Strategic Engagement Office. To my dear colleague, Rob Scolle, couldn't have done it without your intellectual powerhouse um, brain in this space. Um, to our PPI team, Justin, Sophia, Bill and Gay, our fabulous volunteers from our Masters of Public Policy program. But most of all to Susan, Suzanne and Lincoln for their dedicated support. Suzanne's been on this project with us from the start, which is now 20 months old from concept to now. So um, can I just ask you to take a moment to thank our hard working team. But last and not by any means least, um, I'd like to thank or ask you to join with me in thanking again our seven international speakers who've travelled a very long way to, to be with us and to share their insights and to cope with their jet lag and they're getting on planes again tomorrow at six o'clock in the morning um, and we couldn't have done it without them. So to Hosok, Sherry, Richard, Mari, Jianping, Fuku and Lucian, thank you very much. And I'd just like to hand over to Van Gelly for the final word.